So now then, let's move on and look at our final measure of central tendency. In particular, the mean, which is the most common measure of central tendency as well, especially for continuous data. And it just represents the mathematical average. This is a measure with which I'm sure you're already familiar also. So let's take a little bit easier number of um, values to manage and look at the scores showing up on the screen here now. 8, 16, 4, 3, 4, 7, 4, 9, and 8. Now, if what we want to do is to find the average of these numbers, then to find the average, as we know, we simply add up all of our different scores and divide by the number of scores in our sample. Now, based off the notation we've already introduced, that's shown right here. Okay? The mean, or x bar, that is the average of the x's, is simply equal to the sum, sigma, of all of the x scores over n, the number of scores. So as you can imagine, we just add up all of our scores here. If we're to do that, we get a total, and you can verify this yourself, of 63, divided by the fact that there are nine scores, produces a mean of 63 divided by nine, or seven for this set of scores. Now, in addition to just knowing what these different measures of central tendency are, as I mentioned, it's important to know the characteristics of the different measures as well. In particular, what we need to know is how sensitive some of these different measures are to different properties of the data with which you're going to be dealing. The first thing to realize is the mode is always going to be a score that's actually present in your data. So if this is the desirable characteristic, if what you're trying to do is to convey the data that you have by using a number that's actually present in your sample, then the mode or the median are going to be the best choices for you, because the mode is always going to be a score present in the data by definition. In fact, it's the most frequently occurring score in the data. The median is usually going to be a score present in the data, as long as it doesn't fall between some of the bottom half and top half of an even numbered data set. Then the median is also going to be a score that's actually present in the data as well, and therefore it's typically going to make sense. That's why a lot of times you'll see, for example, the median report for a lot of census type of data, because it makes a lot more sense to say that the average household has two of something or three of something than to say that it has 2.2475 of something. Okay, because no household is actually going to have 2.2475 kids or TVs or cell phones or anything else. And so you'll see the median specifically for the reason that it, it is a desirable property, that it is an actual value that's going to be present in the data and more interpretable in that regard as well. Okay, this is typically not going to be the case for the mean. It happened to be in our last example. Okay, but a lot of times when you calculate a mathematical average, you are going to get some decimal value that isn't an actual score in your data set. Now, another thing that's going to distinguish between these three different measures is how sensitive they are to the different outliers you might have in your data. Now, you may recall that an outlier is data that falls outside of the typical range. In other words, it might be an extreme score in your data set. Well, the mode is going to be unaffected by outliers. And you can think about it because, again, by definition, if the mode is the most frequently occurring score, the only way outliers are going to change the mode is if there's so many of them that they become the new mode, in which case they're not really even outliers anymore. Now, the median is going to be relatively unaffected by outliers because, again, you're looking at the center score. Unless you're adding so many outliers at one specific end of the distribution, that what it's doing is really changing your count towards the middle, then it's not really going to change the median too much as well. It may have an effect, but it's typically going to be a, a relatively small one. Now the mean is greatly influenced by outliers. And so if you're in a situation where you have a data set that might be susceptible to outliers, or where outliers you know are already present, then that might make the mean a measure that you do not necessarily want to report. Think about if you add one value to the data set that we just had on the previous slide, where the sum was 63, we divided by 9 and we got 7, right? Well, what if we were to add one extreme score in there of, oh, I don't know, maybe 1,000? If we add one outlier of 1,000, that will bring our new sum to 1,063. And when we divide by 10, the new set number of scores in our data set, that's going to change our mean from 7, as we found before, to 106.3. Okay, that's going to be a huge change just by adding one single outlier to our data set. And a lot of times this is an undesirable property of the mean or the mathematical average. The great thing is it is taking every single score into account by calculating this average. But again, 
If those scores are outliers, that can be problematic. Now, another advantage of the mean is that it's mathematically, algebraically tractable. That is, it's very easy to define exactly how to calculate the mean in every single situation. You don't have to look at a histogram and figure out which column is the highest. You don't have to count in from the top and the bottom and then determine whether or not you have an even or odd number of scores in your data set. Okay? And so when we're basing other calculations off of some measure of central tendency, that makes the mean desirable in that sense as well. And that's why you see the mean, not the median or the mode, entering calculations for a lot of our other formulas, like the variance and other formulas we're going to consider over the course of this semester and next semester as well, is because it is the one that is the most mathematically tractable. Now, most importantly, is to distinguish, depending on the type of data that you have, that is a lot of times going to help know which of these central tendency measures is going to be the best. When you have nominal data, for example, you can't really calculate a median or a mean. In fact, the mode then is going to be your only choice. You want to know out of all of the different categories or labels that you have on your nominal data, which one is occurring the most. Are there more freshmen, sophomores, juniors, or seniors at your party, for example? When you're looking at ordinal or interval data, a lot of times that is where you'll see the median used as well. Because again, it's going to be a desirable property to have something that is an actual value on your scale. So if you think about it, something ranging from very unlikely to unlikely to somewhat likely, very likely, extremely likely. Okay? If you have some sort of scale like this, it doesn't really make sense to calculate a mean of those different values and report something that falls in between, say, somewhat likely and likely. Okay? It's going to be much easier or better to commit to one of those values. Same with a ranking system. Okay? If you want to look at what is your sort of average or middle ranking across a number of different scales, okay, you're going to be interested in the median in this case because it makes a lot more sense to say that, yes, on average we were ranked 35th on some sort of system rather than to say, on average, we were rated 33.145. Again, the decimals don't really make sense when you're talking about different ranking or ordinal scales, and often not with a lot of the interval scales that we're using in psychological science as well. And as we mentioned at the outset or the introduction of the mean, it is most commonly used with continuous data when, as we know with continuous data, these very fine-grained measurements and decimals, those values do in fact make sense. And so there, it makes perfect sense to use the mean or the mathematical average because reporting that value is typically going to make sense as well. So you should definitely review this slide right here and these different properties. These are very important to know what are the characteristics of and times when you want to use these different measures. Let's look at a few examples of this to make sure it makes sense before wrapping up this first half of the lecture. So what if you were doing a study with some college freshmen and you asked them all for their age? What measure of central tendency would you use in this case? Because this is a continuous measure, and we don't have any reason to believe there's going to be a dramatic sense of outliers among college freshmen, those are the situations where we would want to use the mean when we have continuous data and not a risk of a lot of outliers that are going to skew our data. So the mean would certainly be appropriate in this case. Let's think of a different situation. What if you were looking at school rankings? So say that there were a number of different magazines that were ranking Miami University. And we wanted to know across the set of all of these different rankings, where do we stand? Well, you should recall from the previous slide, this is exactly the situation I introduced, where you would probably going to want to use the median in this case. For ranking or ordinal type data, the median is usually what's going to make the most sense. Now think about the next few on your own, and you're going to want to record your answers to these in order to take the online quiz for this lecture. What about if you're recording the yes or no votes for a policy and some sort of board or in some sort of senate or any other sort of governing body? What is the measure of central tendency that you want to use to summarize this data? Yes and no votes. What about if you're looking at the number of missed classes? You may be wanting to relate the number of classes somebody misses to their performance in school. And so what you do is ask people how many classes they've missed, and you look at this value across all of your different students, and you want to summarize this data with a measure of central tendency. What would you use in this case? Finally, what if you were looking at is you wanted to report sort of 
the middle or average income of the residents of LA. So what you do is again you have that data, you collect the, the, the salaries of all of the residents and you want to present some sort of summary statistic to capture that information. What is the measure of central tendency that you might use in this case and why? So again record your answers to these three questions here because you'll need those to complete the online quiz. This though concludes the first part of this lecture series on central tendency and variability covering central tendency. Of course then next we'll move on and the second half we'll look at variability measures.